In his book, Donald Shelby wrote, in his book called Love is Gratitude, Donald Shelby described how a friend told him how when he was a young boy, his father's birthday rolled around and he didn't realize it until it was too late to go and get him a birthday present. So he went into his room and went through everything he had and he put together 17 cents. He put the dime, the nickel, and two pennies into an envelope and gave it to his father with a note which said, I love you, Dad. Happy birthday. Thanks for being the best dad in the whole wide world. I'm sorry I didn't get you a gift. This is all that I've got. Years later, at his father's death, when he was going through his dad's possessions, the son discovered within a special compartment of his father's wallet the envelope, the note, the dime, the nickel, and the two pennies. His father had carried them with him all those years. And he wondered why. Why, of all the things that he and his dad had gone through together and experienced together, why was this gift kept as the most precious reminder of their relationship? He said he realized it was because of pure love and pure gratitude. That's what our scripture readings are also about today. Luke is the only gospel writer to record this story. It's a rather straightforward story. A Pharisee named Simon invites Jesus to his house for a meal, and Jesus went. And there were undoubtedly other Pharisees there as well. Remember, though, a Pharisee 2,000 years ago in ancient Israel was considered to be a top-notch person, a very good person, very religious people. They loved God, and they sought to live according to God's word as best they possibly could. Homes in those days were much more open to the outside than they are today. So a person was able to simply walk in off the street uninvited. Simon the Pharisee might not have been as upset that an uninvited guest walked in, but was most upset as to who the uninvited guest was, who just came waltzing in. And it became even more disconcerting, more upsetting for Simon as the events unfolded in his house. Because while everyone was talking and eating or trying to and passing the time of day, this woman was weeping and her tears were flooding over the feet of Jesus and she was washing his feet with her tears and then drying them with her hair. Can you imagine the sight and what Simon the Pharisee must have been feeling and thinking? We don't know much about this woman. There's been some speculation over the centuries by commentators that this woman was the woman caught in adultery that Jesus set free in John's Gospel chapter 8. But the, whatever the case, she must have been someone who at the very least was aware of Jesus' gracious love and was drawn to him. Some would say uninvited and yet doesn't Jesus' love always invite anybody and everybody to him? She was so overwhelmed by Jesus that she wept. Her tears, perhaps understood as an expression of repentance, but also tears of overwhelming gratitude and adoration for who Jesus is. <coughs> Simon must have been a little bit baffled and more than a little bit annoyed at this disturbance and this <coughs> defiling of his dinner time. He didn't know what to do, and you can hear him through Luke muttering to himself, Oh my goodness, Jesus must not realize that this woman is a tramp off the streets, a prostitute. If he knew who she was, if he, he would never allow her to sit anywhere near us, 
let alone to near to him, and let alone touching him. I wonder if I should call the servants to escort this woman out of here. In Simon the Pharisee's mind, such a sinner polluted everything. Now Jesus either heard Simon muttering to himself or knew exactly what he was thinking. And he says, Simon, listen, when I came into your house, you did not follow the customary procedure of providing hospitality to me. You didn't offer me water to wash the dust off my feet. You didn't give me oil for my hair. You didn't welcome me with a kiss of greeting. And yet, this woman has come in and bathed my feet with her tears, wiped my feet with her hair, and anointed me with expensive perfume. So Simon, I have a question for you. If two debtors owed someone money, one of them owes $100,000 and the other one owes $500, and neither of them can pay the debt, and the person forgives the debt of both of them, which one of them do you think will be more grateful? And Simon responds, the one who has been forgiven the greatest debt. Correct, says Jesus. And then he turns to the woman, this sinner, and he says to her, your sins are forgiven. It's definitely a dramatic story, one of the most dramatic stories in the Gospels. Did you notice that Jesus did not say to the woman that her sins were forgiven? Did you notice that Jesus did not take the side of Simon, the righteous one? Did you notice that Jesus was supportive of the sinner, the woman before the law? That as some have said, Jesus was in support of this sinner. Earlier in Luke chapter 5, Jesus said that those who are healthy have no need of a physician. I have not come to call the righteous but sinners to repentance. Only the sick need a doctor. Oh, it was hard for Simon, Simon, I'm sure, that particular mealtime day. He was shocked by it all. And to a degree, wouldn't we be shocked if we were in his shoes? Isn't it amazing that we have a tendency to forget things? Any of you ever forget things? <coughs> It's kind of part of our human nature <coughs> to forget. And then some people forget things far more often than other people do. But isn't it also amazing that we can have a tendency to forget why we're in the church in the first place? What drew us to Christ? And isn't it amazing that sometimes maybe we don't think about that very often? Maybe we're here because we think this is where decent people should be. Well, of course, the church is a place for decent people. But how often do we forget that the church is supposed to be a hospital for sinners? A place where all who sin are called, invited, and welcomed with open arms by the generous, gracious, forgiving love of God revealed through Jesus Christ. So do we need to be shocked and re-shocked from time to time by stories like this, by stories like the parable of the prodigal son? Do we need to be shocked over and over to stay aware that Jesus is, as an old hymn says, on the side of sinners, that Jesus is for Sinners. The church is not the church, truly, unless its ministry reflects 
that about Jesus. Jesus is for sinners. <coughs> oh, wait a minute. Do you mean that Jesus is on the side of people who commit crimes? Yes. Do you mean that Jesus is on the side of those who traffic in human life, those who are caught in the culture of drugs that squeeze and smothers others' lives to death? Yes. That Jesus is on the side of those who abuse <coughs> life because life has abused them? Yes. What about perks and victims alike? Yes. Jesus is on the side of those who know themselves as sinners, as well as those who don't know that they are sinners. <coughs> Absolutely. That's what the gracious love of God is all about. Think about it. Jesus' grace and love is so radical that it even risks being misunderstood as an affirmation of sin when that's not the case. Do you see it? If that can get through to us, really sink down deep into our hearts, then we'll, we will know that it is not only the sinner who is accepted, but also the righteous who are invited and accepted and welcomed as well. <clears throat> that is great good news. Christ on the side of sinners. <clears throat> and we've had for centuries, we've had this view of separation, <clears throat> that there are sinners and then there are the saints. And we forget that the saints are still sinners who realize more and more the depth of their sin and the super depth of the gracious forgiveness of God. <coughs> if that gets through to us, we would know that those who think and behave like they are the righteous folks, and those who know themselves to be the worst of sinners, and everyone in between that range, that spectrum, everyone is invited and welcomed to we are forgiven because of Jesus Christ. And we don't have to trudge through this life with all the burden of guilt for our sins that we hardly ever talk about with one another. And that leads to another way of stating the same thing that this story has for us. Jesus' love is absolutely unconditional. In this story, in Jesus' words and actions, he demonstrates the radical nature of the gospel that the church is called and empowered by the Spirit to also incarnate, to make alive, to reveal through our lives and how the church lives in the world. Jesus did not say, did you notice I asked this earlier? Jesus didn't say that he forgave the woman. He declared that she is forgiven. Her state of mind, her response of love, show that something great has already happened in her life, in her heart. And nothing greater can happen to a human being than to discover the depth of God's love for them and that in Christ they are forgiven. Forgiveness means reconciliation in spite of. It means reunion in spite of. It means acceptance of those who are unacceptable that we declare to be and judge in our own minds to be unacceptable. It means welcome to those that we'd rather not welcome. Forgiveness is unconditional. Or else it isn't forgiveness at all, is it? Forgiveness has the character of in spite of, but we self-righteous ones from time to time give it the character of forgiveness because of. 
That's not it at all. In Christ, we are forgiven in spite of what we have done wrong. Not because of something we have done right. Not because we try to behave right. The Bible describes how in spite of all that we are and all that we have done wrong, our sin, God in Christ reconciles the world to himself. God in Christ forgives us. God in Christ has done for us what we cannot possibly do for ourselves. The woman was already forgiven. And she was demonstrating some of the depth of that knowledge by what she did. We don't know exactly how that might have come about in her life. It must have been, might have been something that she knew about Jesus. Maybe she'd already been the recipient of his gracious, forgiving love if she was the woman from John 8, the woman caught in adultery. Maybe she'd heard Jesus preach once before. Maybe they'd had a previous conversation, or maybe some others who had been forgiven and set free by Jesus shared Jesus with her, and she started to believe herself. However it happened, we don't know. But she was there and demonstrated in her response of love that Jesus' love has touched her heart. And the story closes with the clear words of Jesus' teaching to Simon, to the one who knew that he was very righteous. Jesus said, Therefore I tell you, her sins, which were many, have been forgiven. And so she has shown great love. But the one to whom little is forgiven, they love little. Think about it for a minute. Are we known, are you known as a person of great love? If we're not loving much, if something is getting in the way of our loving others as we might and as we ought to, as we are called to in Christ, then maybe our sense of forgiveness is not strong enough. If we truly realize how much we are forgiven, wouldn't we love more? And wouldn't that love growing in us move us to be more forgiving as well? Well, let's be honest. All of us can understand Simon's shock, can't we? Because we, as human beings, we write people off for whatever reasons. What is the nature of forgiveness then? It's not about condoning sin. Put ourselves, which can be all too easily, in Simon's place. Can we believe that the repentance of a woman of this kind, that her repentance is genuine and that she's been transformed? Don't we usually think quietly in our minds that such people will never be able to stay free of their sin? They're going to return to their former ways so we see her kissing and anointing the Lord's feet. And we think to ourselves as she wipes his hair with her his feet with her hair and pours expensive perfume on his feet, we think it's not gonna last. Nope. Nope. People like her don't change. She'll be back to her old, her old life in a month, maybe less. But then, I'm going to ask a hard question. So what? So what if she returns to her former life of sin? Does that nullify God's forgiveness? Or does that place a condition on God's love and a condition on His forgiveness? God's love and forgiveness is not dependent upon 
our doing good or bad. God's forgiveness in Christ is pure and simple and unconditional no matter what. But this woman, if we read on in Luke chapter 8, we'll find that Luke describes how there were, as Jesus continued his preaching tour and visiting in, in villages and towns up and down the countryside, he tells us that there was a group of women who were following Jesus and the disciples throughout this tour who were meeting all the needs, who were caring for Jesus and the disciples. Couldn't this woman have been one of them too? What they all had in common, undoubtedly, was gratitude for Jesus. Gratefulness for Jesus setting them free from slavery to sin. Gratefulness for Jesus delivering them from a, de a demon. Grateful for Jesus healing them of whatever was ailing them. Gratefulness for having been touched <coughs> by the unconditional love of Jesus. Couldn't she have been one of those, that group of women? Their gratitude was not just a rising tide, temporary, a tide of emotion that expressed itself in some momentous moments, their gratitude was expressed through the tiresome, unromantic work of serving Jesus and his disciples. And it could well be that this woman who burst into Simon the Pharisee's house that day and did that to his feet out of an expression of gratitude and love and thankfulness was now part of that group of women serving Jesus. So we need to ponder a thought. If we know how much we have been forgiven, truly forgiven, would we be living any differently than we are right now? How would our attitudes and how the way we treat people, how would that be different, especially towards those who have hurt us? How deeply do we realize the unconditional loving forgiveness of the Lord in our own lives? He puts no conditions on it. Why do we?